big surprise. <laughs> Good morning. I'm enjoying the fact that I get to be in the same venue as the, uh, as the keynote, because that means a lot of extra people are here who just didn't bother to leave. But there was cakes in between time. Okay, um, last year uh, in Melbourne, I gave a talk about what we were hoping to do to uh, fix a lot of long-standing problems in the rendering aspects of the X window system. Uh, this year, um, I decided to actually come back and tell you what we did actually manage to do, which was almost all of what we promised last year. This is kind of an unusual change from my usual presentation. We actually have stuff that we did instead of th stuff that we'd like to do. I'd like to recap a little bit of what, what I talked about last year in Melbourne. Um, for those who uh, weren't able to attend or who are too drunk to remember. Um, how things are drawn on the screen and how the architecture of the system works. And I want to show you what, what we did, how, how I spent my, my summer vacation. I mean, is it, uh, of course, there's always more work to be done, so I'm going to uh, talk about what we're planning on doing in the near term unfinished business. Okay, where were we last year? Where, where last year I talked about the fact that when you had a 3D application on the screen and you wanted to run Compiz, that 3D application conflicted with Compiz and bad things happened. Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that when you plug in a monitor, the computer wouldn't automatically detect the new monitor's presence and light it up. Um, talk about the fact that applications when they use different APIs, we have three different APIs in environment. We have 2D, applica uh, 2D APIs, 3D APIs, OpenGL, and we have uh, various media APIs coming out, XV, XVMC, uh, VA API, or VDPAU. A bunch of different APIs are coming out. Uh, those were all different, and then you couldn't use mix and match APIs. And we know in our, in our world of the remix these days that it's nice to be able to uh, mix different media types. Uh, one of the things we couldn't do is we couldn't control the graphics card from the kernel, which meant that when your computer crashed, you did not get a blue screen of death, and we were desperate to be able to display the information about why your computer crashed so that we could actually collect that information and fix bugs. Um, so we wanted to be able to actually display panic messages. Um, and the other thing is that um, all of our 2D drawing was done up in user space, so we couldn't use the fact that with the hardware supported DMA, it supported interrupts, it's, you could block. Um, so we fixed all that stuff in this last year. So in January last year, I talked about a bunch of stuff we wanted to do. In January last year, we were talking about how we were going to do this. What was the big limiting factor? Why have we been stuck with all of these problems for so long? What was, the, what was the limiting factor? It's a very tiny factor that people who used to program in Fortran were also limited by in the 1960s. Anybody know of the big limitation in Fortran? Fortran didn't have malloc. Well, until this year, we had the equivalent problem in our Windows system. We had no way of allocating memory in the graphics engine. We had no memory manager. Does that seem like an obvious thing to do? I've got a card with two gigabytes of memory in it, and I have no memory allocator? <laughs> yeah. So it really was, that was the key limiting feature for all of the advancements that we've done in the last year. We decided we'd just sit down and we'd make it happen. Now, in January last year, um, uh, uh, Thomas Hellstrom uh, was working on a memory manager called TTM, and we spent um, about seven months or so trying to figure out how TTM worked. Now, Thomas has worked on TTM for a long time and built a very sophisticated system that would handle a lot of different graphical card environments. We have a very simple world that we wanted to focus on first. Um, we wanted to focus on uh, uh, um, UMA graphics, you know, where you have just one address space. You don't have uh, graphics memory on the card, you just have system memory. Um, so. So what is kernel memory management giving us? Uh, kernel memory manager just gives us persistent objects. When you allocate an object with a kernel memory manager, you can actually write data to it, and that data stays around. It doesn't get erased randomly, because somebody else decides to use the same piece of video memory that you were using. But you don't have to keep a backup of it. When we were running 3D applications before, if you copied little bits between your um, images in a 3D application, we had to do that with the CPU. 
because we had to keep a backup of all that data in case the memory on the video card was taken by somebody else. With a kernel memory manager, all of a sudden that memory is persistent. Not only that, but with a kernel memory manager, you can have multiple applications sharing access to the same object. Does this remind anybody of a like, time sharing? When did we get a file system that allowed us to share objects on the disk between processes? Was that 1950 some? <laughs> yeah, I know, we're reinventing the operating system every 50 years, whether we need to or not. Um, in this case, it's for graphics. Not only that, not only can I share objects between different GL applications or different X applications, I can now share objects between APIs. So I can take a 2D X image and I can convert, uh, turn it into a texture for a 3D application. Conversely, I can take a media, a YUV media image, and move that into my 2D application. They're all transformable. It's all globally unique, and it's just a bag of bits. So it really is like the Unix file system for graphics objects. Um, and in fact, we thought very hard about whether we should create a file system out of that, and out of this, and we haven't yet. But it very clearly has most of the attributes of a file system. Names, sharing, permissions, that kind of stuff. The other cool thing that we got out of creating a kernel memory manager is that all of a sudden our objects could become pageable. Now, you know, most of you don't care about paging. Most of you have enough memory that all of your working set fits in physical memory. But the nice thing about paging is that all of a sudden you don't have to worry about running out of physical memory on a system that has a limited resource. You can build APIs that depend on having um, a large amount of address space and, the, and that will run even on smaller machines. It gives you effectively infinite storage, limited only by your ability to purchase SSDs. Which Intel sells. Yeah. Um, the other cool thing is that by, by making the, the contents pageable and managed by the uh, kernel, we don't have to have user space moving data between these arbitrary partitions of memory. We used, to, we used to have some memory that was owned by the GPU and some memory owned by the CPU, and we'd actually have the CPU moving memory back and forth. Now with paging now, one of the things we could do with paging is we could take a system memory page and give it to the graphics engine. We don't have to copy it, we can just map it. It's like virtual memory or something. So what did we build? We built, yeah, we built a file system to hold our data, and we built a virtual memory system to hold our, uh, to, hold, uh, to um, uh, share data. Okay, so what did we build? We built this in April of last year. We built something called GEM, the Graphics Execution Manager. Um, only a slight backronym. We really did um, want to talk about the notion that it wasn't just managing memory. It really is managing the whole execution environment of the graphics engine. It's a kernel memory manager. It also manages um, uh, the execution of commands in the graphics engine. Um, it was integrated into Linux 2.6.28. Hooray. Um, the initial develop development was done in April. And by April, I mean we started a discussion about what we wanted to do in the last week of March. We started development in probably, uh, just about April Fool's Day. And by the end of April, we had 2D and 3D graphics running on this new memory manager. So that's 30 days of development uh, to get a prototype running and to show whether our ideas had any merit. And anything that works in 30 days seems like a, seems that is pr providing um, similar levels of functionality performance to an existing system that you can implement in 30 days and you can actually get your brain around. Seems like a good idea. Um, let's see, it was announced, I think I have a uh, timeline. So here's our process, here's a calendar. So in March, um, Eric Anholt, um, one of my coworkers at Intel, came up to me and said, you know, we've been studying TTM, uh, Thomas Hellstrom's uh, memory manager, for about eight months trying to get 2D and 3D graphics working in this environment, and we failed. You know, we've patently failed. Either we're not smart enough, his system isn't flexible enough, or we haven't figured out how to use it yet. You know, what about this environment is making it difficult? His uh, TTM was developed for 3D to, uh, as an underlying, uh, the underpinnings for MESA, for uh, memory management. It wasn't designed for 2D graphics. So in a lot of ways, we had some strong conflicts between what his system provided and what our 2D environment needed. And we needed to do both 2D and 3D graphics. So we, we clearly hadn't figured out how to use his system. So we said, okay, instead of trying to build a memory manager for, that works on all graphics cards, that works in every possible environment, 
and that does 3D graphic, that is focused solely on 3D graphics. How about if we build a memory manager that works on the simplest kind of graphics card, a unified memory graphics card, where you have one kind of pages or system pages, and they can either be mapped by the CPU or by the GPU. You don't have these multiple memory spaces that you have in a discrete graphics card where you have some piles of memory on your video card and some piles of memory that can be mapped to an AGP aperture and other piles of memory that are accessed by the CPU. That's a much more complex environment. We don't know how to solve that problem yet. Let's focus on a problem we know how to solve. All the memory is the same and we can map it either, the GP, either into the CPU's address space or into the GPU's address space. So in April, uh, we spent four weeks building an implementation. Um, in May 13th, we announced it on LKML in response to a question about, so when is TTM getting integrated into the kernel? Um, and Dave Ailey said, well, you know, I'm not so sure about TTM. It hasn't been shown useful in any other drivers. Um, and so TTM was, um, hasn't been integrated yet because nobody's using it. Um, so in June and July, GEM becomes really functionally useful. It's not just running demonstration applications, it's running the whole desktop. So we spent the summer making it useful. Um, on July 30th, we took a really big step. Uh, it doesn't seem like a big deal uh, outside of our environment. What, what we did is we fundamentally changed our development model. We, ch we changed from being 2D and 3D graphics hackers to being kernel hackers. We took our source code out of our own repository out of our own private DRM, uh, DRM tree, and we just integrated it right into the kernel tree, right into the Linux kernel tree. We said, you know, this is a kernel driver. This uses kernel infrastructure. We're changing the other, the other pieces of the kernel to support our driver. We need to adopt the kernel development model for our own driver development, because that's the only place we're going to make it work. And so, uh, yes, we basically abandoned all the B, uh, people developing uh, the software for BSD to their own devices. Um, sorry, not really. Um, they deserve it. Uh, <laughs> oh, it, was it was great. But it's a, it was a huge change for us because all of a sudden we've abandoned layers of abstraction and layers of cruft around making this cross kernel, kernel driver infrastructure. And we went and said, okay, we're going to focus on building a memory manager and an execution manager for Linux that supports Intel integrated graphics. And that's all we focused on. Let's get one thing to work and generalize from there instead of trying to build the biggest system that works for everybody and then uh, make, try to specialize it for particular platforms. We're hoping that Gem will generalize. Uh, Gem is being ported to BSD. It works fine in that environment. Um, I'm, I think Gem is being ported to Solaris, but I'm not sure. So the, the basic API seems relatively sound across OSs. Um, what we don't know uh, what's going to happen is whether the GEM infrastructure works in a discrete memory environment. Now I know that the Radeon developers are working on getting a GEM API uh, to support their environment, but they aren't using the GEM infrastructure yet. So. Uh, October 17th, uh, GEM was merged into the main line, and on December 24th, uh, Christmas Eve, uh, because Linus has no life, uh, he shipped 2628 and went off to play with his family. He's been home for a week and a half playing with his children. What's he doing? Releasing 2628. <laughs> yeah. I was digging snow off my roof. Okay. Uh, so I have a, a, a slide on the GEM architecture. I wanted to tell you how it works. The first thing we did is we said, okay, we're not going to duplicate anything that already exists in the Linux kernel. Uh, one thing that we don't want to duplicate is uh, basic page allocation. Uh, I think the kernel knows how to do that. Uh, we actually found an in, uh, a kernel subsystem that did exactly what we wanted. It would give me a bag of pages that were backed by swap. ShimFS, right? It's just a bag of pages. So we actually went into the ShimFS system and found a function down there that did precisely what we wanted. You give it a little pointer um, to a data structure and it initializes it and fills it full of pages and hands it back to you. And then you could ask to have those pages mapped into main memory or you could uh, release them and let them get written out to swap if they wanted to be. Um, ShimFS handles uh, reading and writing these pages uh, with the user mode uh, APIs. It, it supports mapping them into user space. Um, our theory was that writing our own code would be far worse than using ShimFS, and uh, oddly, uh, it worked out pretty well, uh, because we got to not implement uh, uh, 1,500 lines of code. 
Um, the big architect architectural imperative for GEM is to focus on cash management. Now I know that one of the Intel mantras has always been that we have cash coherency, right? We have cash coherency for DMA operations, we have cash coherency between CPUs, um, so that applications don't have to worry about caches. And in fact, it's gotten to the point where um, a lot of the cache management stuff, it doesn't even, it's not even exposed to user space. Uh, one operation in particular is where uh, CPU or DMA writes to memory. There's actually a buffer in the memory controller called the global write buffer. Anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, one person's heard of it. Well, okay, that global write buffer, I have to flush it in order for my GPU to see the data. Is the, is the uh, register used to prod that global write buffer documented anywhere? Is it the same across CPUs? No, <laughs> because nobody is supposed to need to know how to do that because we're supposed to have cache coherency, except where we don't. Um, yeah. So what we discovered is that the biggest problem we were having with TTM, which, which is where TTM was a huge, uh, huge learning aid to us, was in managing non-cache coherent domains. We have a whole bunch of different caches in the GPU, and we have the CPU as a separate cache. When we copy data between objects for different operations in the system, we have to know which caches hold that data. So Jen's entire memory management mechanism is focused on remembering which cache holds data and whether that data is from a read operation or a write operation. Um, the problem is, is that moving data between cache domains is very expensive. Um, to move data from the CPU cache into the GPU cache, I have to call this instruction called CL flush. And CL flush works on a single cache line. So I execute CL flush a number of times to flush a page. CL flush is a big hammer. It's not as big as what we used to use with write back invalidate. But what it does is it flushes those pages from the cache and invalidates those cache entries. So if I ever touch that memory again with the CPU, what does it have to do? It has to read it back from main memory. And there's nothing between the CPU and main memory at that point other than a whole lot of cycles. So the thing that we desperately want to avoid is moving uh, memory between cache domains. The applications, when they're doing operations with the GPU or with the CPU, they, they, they know, well they should know, which cache domain the operations are in. So we're expecting, so the kernel doesn't track what cache domains operations do. The kernel is told by user space, this operation needs to have uh, the data in the, in the texture read cache. Um, we support having data in multiple read domains. So if you have an operation that's reading from a texture, say you're, um, say you're painting some data with the CPU and some with the GPU, and you're sharing a common texture, we allow that data to reside in both the CPU and GPU read cache. But what we don't support is the notion of having an object, as large as it wants to be, an object can only be in one write domain. Now obviously we could have subdomains within the objects, and there's a huge, uh, a huge amount of discussion about whether that was a good idea <clears throat> if you wanted to implement a user space allocator to do sub-allocation of these objects. And we abandoned that. We said, no, nope. allocations are in the kernel. Each object gets to be in one right domain. A tremendous simplifying assumption, of course. Um, we thought when we started this that this would be really hard, managing all these cache domains. We thought we would constantly make mistakes and get caching wrong and constantly end up hanging the CPU or hanging the GPU or having terrible performance problems. Um, well, unfortunately, uh, we were right. <laughs> this has turned out to be a huge pain. And yeah, so when you're designing a new CPU or designing a new GPU, um, I vote for cache coherence. Yeah, I don't get any votes uh, at, this, at this point. Okay, well, actually, I have another slide on Jim, because uh, I couldn't get it in one slide. Um, one of the things that, we're, that Jim does is it refuses to expose a physical object address to user space. User space has no idea where in the GPU an object resides. That's none of its business, right? When you give an object to the kernel, you say, I want to do a bit from this object to this other object, you tell the kernel, the name of the object, not where it resides. That means that the kernel is completely free to shuffle things around in video memory. 
That means that when you run out of your tiny little two gigabyte video aperture, you can boot stuff out, shuffle stuff around, and execute the operation without going back to user space and saying, uh, sorry, whatever you asked me to do, I can't do that now. Um, user space just provides relocations. You know, we're used to doing this when you're doing linking. Uh, you, uh, you link up an application dynamically at runtime with a shared library, and it resolves all the relocations as the application runs. We do the same thing now for these graphical objects. You provide a reference to the object, you provide an offset within that object, it computes the relocation and, and patches the execution. Um, the tremendous simplifying assumption here is that now applications know precisely how much memory is available for their operation. They have it all. They always have it all. If you need to use two, giga two gigabytes of um, aperture for a particular operation, you know that that operation can succeed because there is some way the kernel can shuffle stuff around to get rid of the rest of it. Um, we expose this notion of a batch buffer. Now, this, this may seem very, very Intel GPU-centric, but it turns out that, oddly, most of the graphic sensors who know about what they want is they want to have a big buffer full of commands. They want to be uh, given, you know, do a blit here, set up your 3D engine this way, perform some 3D primitives. They want to be given a list of commands to execute, kind of like a, kind of like a, a set of uh, CPU instructions. So we expose this batch buffer as a fundamental scheduling unit. Uh, the user space constructs a bunch of graphics commands in a buffer, hands them to the kernel and says, execute these. Um, that batch buffer actually has internal relocations pointing at other buffers and all those relocations resolved in this giant tree. It's all kind of fun. Um, and the objects remain mapped until execution finishes. So when you post a batch buffer into the kernel, the kernel is going to hand that buffer to the GPU. Before it hands it to the GPU, it's going to make sure that all the objects are needed for it to execute that operation are mapped into the GPU and the GPU can do the whole thing. Now it can have multiple buffers pending execution. One of the requirements for GPUs to go really fast is that they have lots of stuff to do and they never have to wait for you. So we want to make sure we can pile a bunch of stuff onto the GPU and let it just, you know, get as much data as it wants. Um, but what, so what that means is that we have to make all of these, all of these um, memory objects pinned, you know, pinned in the, because we've already computed the relocations, all the data's pending. Uh, we want to pile it all onto the GPU. If we run out of aperture, though, it's the kernel who is now in charge of saying, oh, I can't do this operation. There's not enough space yet. I'll just wait for some of the uh, pending stuff to complete, and then I'll throw away their objects and make room for these new ones. So the kernel is to in total control of doing all the scheduling. Uh, one of the things that we could do is we could actually do a little speculative scheduling. You know, we just put a few things, we tell the GPU to go execute a few things, and then we hold a bunch in the kernel away from the GPU. And then after we get five or six of them, we can say, ah, oh, I can rearrange the objects like this, and all of these can be queued up to the GPU. So when our GPUs get more massively parallel, we should be able to take advantage of that. Let's see. Um, one of the key tenets, of course, of Linux development is that people do things in the kernel tree as soon as possible and don't try to bring a completed subsystem and say, here's what we want in the kernel, please give this to us, right? How often does that work? Never, right, exactly. So one of our obvious tenets was get a prototype working, show people that we knew what we were doing and we had a good direction going forward, and then ask for help because we didn't know how the kernel wanted this stuff to be integrated. We didn't know a lot of the infrastructure the kernel offered to provide support for the operations we wanted to do. We didn't know what we were doing. Of course not. You know, we're not experts. Nobody's an expert in the Linux kernel. It's the community that's the expert. So to, uh, within two months of starting this project, of, of having the idea, you know, we should really just do our own and start over. We announced it that LK and Well and provided all the code, uh, wrote some documentation about how the architecture was going to work, and then we listened. We submitted the code and we listened. We got feedback from, you know, 40 or 50 different people saying, you know, this part of the code really doesn't work like we want. This part of the code abuses this other kernel API that you're doing in a bad way. Um, we actually got a couple of fairly substantial core kernel changes adopted just for our in infrastructure. Now, obviously, Linux makes this possible. This would not be possible in any other world. We changed ShimFS. 
the function that we wanted to use from shimfs, this shim file setup. Does, anybody, does that sound like an allocation API to anybody? That is the allocation API in shim, shimfs, shim file setup. Badly named. Um, so what we got agreement on was that we would use this existing API, and because gem is in the kernel, and this API is exposed GPL only, so any code that used this API would be in the kernel or public, we could actually get rid of this API when we came up with a better mechanism. Uh, what we proposed, in fact, was to replace the shimfs, uh, shimfs um, allocator with a more generic pageable page allocator shared by shimfs, uh, the sys5 shared memory system, and gem, because all of these three ob uh, subsystems, you want to be able to allocate anonymous pages that are backed by uh, swap. Uh, right now, the sys5 uh, shared memory system actually goes in and uses this function. That's how we found out about it. Oh, this must be public because this other subsystem uses it. And the kernel guy said, came back and said, it's not really public, and sys5 shared memory is special. Okay, did look that special to me. But we did get general agreement that coming up with, maybe coming up with a, a, a better name uh, and perhaps uh, a, 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 a more layered approach that wasn't stealing from shimfs uh, to implement sys5 shared memory and gem was a good idea. Uh, so for 2.6.28 we have this shim file set up and whenever somebody gets excited they'll go and implement something better than that. The other thing that we ended up doing was we ended up um, uh, uh, kind of abusing uh, the KMAP Atomic APIs in the kernel. KMAP, uh, KMAP Atomic is a very fast way to map pages into the kernel address space. Uh, normally changing page tables is horrifically expensive, but the KMAP Atomic mechanism gives us a really efficient way of doing it, which we need to do a lot when you have a two gigabyte GTT aperture. You want to be able to map stuff in and write stuff from kernel space. Um, we got pushback on that when they said, you know, a, it doesn't work unless you have, um, unless you have the KMAP atomic infrastructure available, um, which is only available on four gigabyte high mem systems. And B, you don't need this on 64-bit systems because you can map the entire aperture into the kernel. It's only two gigabytes, a tiny fraction of your 64-bit address space. So what we did is we built a new infrastructure called the IO mapping stuff. What that does is provides the ability to map anonymous pages anywhere in the system fast into the kernel. So that was two really cool results of bringing GEM to the kernel as quickly as possible. Some key infrastructure and key arguments about how to do GEM could be resolved quickly when changing them was easy. And we got what we wanted. Uh, so here are the two main important lessons to learn about why we did gem and how it works. Flushing the CPU cache is painfully slow. You never want to do this. Not only does it flush the CPU cache, it invalidates those cache lines. There's no way to separate those two operations. So when I flush the CPU cache line, the next time I touch that address or any address in that cache line, I'm going to main memory, which is about a thousand cycles away. Yeah. One read, 1,000 cycles. Um, Unfortunately, the only data to get, the only way to get data from the CPU memory into the GPU is to do the flushing. So we have to do it some of the time. We just want to absolutely minimize how often we use this horrible instruction. Um, the other thing we learned was that non-atomic page mapping is really slow. When you want to change the kernel page table entries, you actually have to send an interprocessor interrupt, an IPI, to all the CPUs to get them to invalidate their TLBs and to get them to update uh, their PTEs. Yeah, so you basically stop the entire kernel. Oh, everybody wait, everybody wait, stop. And you invalidate all the pages and then synchronously update the page table entries and go back and execute stuff. Uh, you don't want to do that. Um, the KMAP atomic plot PFN function existed, kind of, uh, on a high mem system that did exactly what we wanted by accident. Uh, we kind of abused it, its accidental uh, capabilities um, to do what we, what we needed. Um, so we came up with a new API that uses the same mechanism but is officially supported. <laughs> Yay. Yay us. Okay, so what is gem replacing? Why do we spend all this time replacing it? It replaces the balkanized memory that we had in the past, where we actually took our tiny little amount of GPU memory and split it up statically at startup time. Static allocation of cursors, overlays, a bunch of state buffers for 2D execution. Um, 
All of the 3D operations had to live in these fixed size front, back, depth, and stencil buffers. You couldn't reallocate them. Uh, XPix maps had their own little chunk of memory that was totally separate from where the 3D textures lived. And the 3D textures were shared across all applications so that whenever your application lost access to the hardware, all of your 3D textures were gone. And if you wanted to use them again, you had to reload them. Um, all the pages that you ever wanted to use for graphics were allocated when the X server started. So if you wanted to use a half a gigabyte of memory for graphics, you physically pinned a half a gigabyte of pages to your GPU. None of the rest of the system could use it. Um, which was on a one gigabyte system, if you wanted to have a half gigabyte GPU aperture, uh, that's brutal. Um, the other result, because we weren't remapping things dynamically into the GPU, was that every time we wanted to move data between the GPU and the CPU, we had to copy it through this write combining aperture. Now the writes weren't so bad, but how many CPU cycles does it take to read four bytes through a write combining aperture? It takes a thousand cycles for every four bytes. Let's do that a few times. Okay, let's copy a gigabyte when I want to swap to another application. Okay, so that was the start. In April, we rebuilt the memory manager. In parallel, we were designing what direct rendering would look like when we had a memory manager. So predicated on having a memory manager, we're doing design of a new direct rendering infrastructure. Um, DOI 2 is a new X extension. The fact that it's a new X extension isn't all that interesting. What the main ideas here are, are relevant for any kind of direct rendering operations. We happen to need, we need to do direct rendering to X. If we build a new window system, we can do direct rendering with that as well using a very similar mechanism. It replaces, oddly, the DOI extension. Um, you can't support both in the X server at the same time, but they are totally separate. Uh, the DRI2 has three basic requests. It's really simple. You can connect, which is to say you can connect your application to the direct rendering infrastructure in the kernel and to the X server. You make this little triangle trade between the three pieces of the system. And that, what, that base, what that essentially does is it says if you can connect to the X server, and you can get, um, or, or if you're allowed to talk to the X server, then the X server tells the kernel, oh, this person, he's okay, let him talk to you, and let him manipulate X specific objects, which is what you need to be able to do to draw to the front buffer and that kind of stuff. So this is authentication stage. And then there's a really simple operation that says, okay, I've got a window, uh, please give me the kernel objects that reflect its front buffer, its back buffer, its depth buffer and its stencil buffers. So you talk to, the, talk to the X server and say, please give me the global names, remember we have these shared global names now, that refer to these buffers that are attached to this window. Um, and then you can do a, very, uh, the, a, a copy operation between these buffers. So for instance, if you want to swap, uh, swap your back buffer to your front buffer, you tell the X server, uh, please copy my back buffer to my front buffer because you've got these global names. Because I've drawn something into the back buffer through the direct rendering infrastructure. Um, we used to have this um, shared memory area that contained a bunch of state information that was shared between all the 3D applications of the X server and the kernel. Um, it was delightful. We never got the data in there wrong. It had a lock inside there. This lock was actually held by applications across system calls. So you have the application um, holding a lock that the X server needed too. Ever, anybody ever try to use GDB on a Mesa application in the land of DRI1? Well, you interrupt your application if the application happens to hold the lock. The X server can't talk to the screen. <laughs> anybody see a problem with that? I, I think it bit everybody at least once. It bit me about once every year. I'd be, you know, happily be bugging along and all of a sudden, bam, GDB would stop after I'd grabbed the lock and, oh, I was dead. I get to kill the, kill, you know, I, you can't switch VTs because the X server can't start again. The X server can't do anything. You're totally locked up. SSH in, kill GDB, kill the application, and things will come back to life. Um, buffer swaps are now done in the X server. This was an anathema in the DRI1 era when this whole notion of having a context switch to the X server just to do a buffer swap was like, oh my god, that'll be too slow. Who owns the screen in our world? 
does the DRI one, does the, the application own the, the frame buffer that talks to this? No, the X server owns it. He's got all the clip lists, he's got all the information about what windows are there. The X server is the only application that has any idea how to do this copy. DRI one worked around this by putting clipping information in this lovely shared memory area, which could never get out of date. Oh, that would never happen. We, say, we decided with DRI two to just say, no, let's just get the application that owns the object that represents the frame buffer to do the copy. It's got the clip list, it can do it all synchronously. There will be no bugs with this. Mm, not too many. The neat thing about it is that DRI 2 is completely independent of the underlying 2D driver. It's completely under, independent of the kernel practically. When it gets a copy request, it just takes these two objects that are referred to and copies them using z existing 2D acceleration operations. It was so simple. We struggled with DRI 1 for 10 years to try to get it to do copies reliably. In the X-Server impl native implementation, it was working within a day. When, when you get that kind of struggle for 10 years, working in one day contrast, it feels good. We were happy with that. Now, oddly, all of the buffers in this thing are gem objects. Now, one of the big changes we made in the design of DRI2 is that we decided to make them not really be officially gem objects. They're arbitrary 32-bit integers. So if you wanted to use a different underlying memory manager, you can use the same extension. But for the Intel driver, they're gem objects. Um, DRI1 used this globally shared front, dap, front, back, depth, and stencil buffers, which meant that when you drew to your back buffer, because somebody else might also be using that same back buffer, you had to clip all your drawing. Um, in DRI1, uh, you had the small shared texture space where you couldn't save any changes. Because the data that you wrote into that, the data that you put into that uh, texture space was, was shared and could go away at any time, there were a huge litany of important 3D extensions that we couldn't implement. Things like frame buffer objects. Any other mutable object where you're taking data from the GPU and writing it to memory, we couldn't implement any of those extensions with DRI1. So all the things we talk about with comp is where you're taking mutable objects, pix maps that you're drawing with the X server, where you're, t um, where you're t uh, drawing to off-screen uh, buffers and copying them onto the screen for a lot of the clutter operations that we do in toolkits like that. We couldn't, we just couldn't implement them. So it's not a matter of performance, it's not a matter of beauty, it's a matter of there are fundamental limitations to the functionality in DRI and we couldn't work around anymore. Um, another important uh, limitation for the uh, for a composited desktop is you couldn't perform that in place texture to pix map. So you couldn't take a, the rendered output of an application and use it as a texture without copying the data through the CPU. Very painful. Uh, another thing we got in it we're working on right now is getting kernel mode setting integrated. Uh, <laughs> kernel mode setting depends upon Gem because everything does. Um, it's a full mode setting API in kernel space. And we're moving it into kernel space. Ooh, to user space. Uh, somebody didn't proofread his slides very well this morning. Um, oh, no, it exposes a full mode setting API from the kernel to user space. I don't even know what I wrote this morning. Um, one of the nice things about this is we can actually provide uh, FB devs who have full backward compatibility for frame buffer applications. Uh, what's the number one user of the frame buffer device? Uh, console. So now all of a sudden I have an infrastructure where I can have graphics and the console subsystem sharing the same device driver. And that's critical because now when the console wants to display information on the screen and the X server is running, the console can say, oh no, the X server, it's not your turn, it's my turn. And the console can tell the, uh, the uh, kernel driver, please display this nice blue screen with white letters on it so that I can actually get information. Actually, uh, one of my coworkers, uh, Dirk Hundle, has an interesting uh, uh, surprise await, uh, awaiting people who are going to have a, a frame buffer console pretty soon. It'll be fun. Um, we've demonstrated the fact that you can run an X server not as root. Tremendous advantage uh, for security perspective. Um, how many people have audited the X server? The X server is some millions of lines of code. You know, I don't think it's ever been subject to a, a very serious sec security audit, at least not in the last 20 years. 
Um, and we actually have the example uh, of the Wayland window system, which demonstrates that we can run two window systems on the hardware at the same time. So that's going to be pretty fun. Um, we're getting to the point where we can run multiple multiple X servers and have accelerated 3D graphics at the same time. With DRI1, you got one X server, and the first one that started got 3D graphics, and everybody else got bupkis. Uh, when 3D becomes important, you, you really need to be able to have all of them. The other nice thing here is that we can support uh, uh, GPGPU operations because anybody can talk to the GPU now. You don't have to be special. Um, we've been working a lot with UXA. UXA basically takes our existing acceleration infrastructure and says, oh wait, you don't have to do memory management anymore. Memory management is done in the kernel. So we throw away all this user mode memory management crap that never worked, and we use the kernel. And it works really well. Um, it's running here, of course. Um, so what's going to happen with UXA in particular? Uh, a lot of people have been asking. UXA at this point is embedded in the Intel driver. Why? Because the API is changing every, every, every day. Um, and I didn't want to change the ABI between the X server and the, and the driver. Um, we're going to try to move UXA back into the X server at some point when we're reasonably happy with the API. We think that it's going to work with multiple, multiple um, kernel memory managers. We may want to add some additional acceleration, not because things need to go faster, but because switching between CPU and GPU is very expensive. And for instance, if you're running Emacs today still, you're still using core text, which means that when you paint your Emacs window, it fills the window with the accelerator, stops the accelerator, flushes the caches, moves the memory back to the CPU domain, paints the text, flushes the CPU caches, moves the memory back to the GPU domain, and then keeps going. Awful. Awful. So we may add core text acceleration just so Emacs goes faster. <laughs> or maybe Emacs will ship a version that doesn't use core text. Anybody betting which will happen first? <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's still a couple of things that are broken. Uh, tearing. Uh, anybody complaining about media? The fact that when you watch a movie with a modern X server, your video tears right across the middle. It's pretty ugly. Uh, it seems really simple. You draw stuff off screen, wait for the right time, copy it onto the screen. But when we're waiting, we don't want to stop the GPU. We want to have it keep doing useful work. That means we need to context switch the GPU. My GPU doesn't do that very well, if at all. So what we want to, what, obviously what we want to do is we want to tell the kernel, at the right time, please copy this data. And then have the kernel wake up on it, interrupt and queue it to the hardware and have it all happen by magic. A uh, couple of minor issues. This copy command has some clipping information in it. The clip list can change. Um, so we're going to you know, have some lo lovely invalidation stuff where the kernel says, the user mode says, oh, that clipping, that blit command that I sent to you, mm -hmm, not so much. Don't do that. We'll do this one instead. Uh, we may miss a frame or two occasionally when you move windows around on the screen. Uh, switching context is going to be hard. Uh, old hardware had a really simple mechanism. Brand new hardware has a really nice mechanism. The medium generation hardware has neither. Oops. Yeah. But I do promise that we have a plan. We're going to try to make it work, and we're going to fix it soon. This is really the worst problem that we're still facing. Uh, and I think, let's see, I have a couple. Ajax is going to talk about that. Uh, 2008, a lot of things happened. My LCA talk last year was full of promises, and I hope I've demonstrated that this year we've got a lot of solutions. There are a lot of other desktops going on this week um, at, at LCA. Carl's giving a talk on how graphics works uh, right after this. Peter's giving a talk this afternoon on our new input infrastructure. Uh, Nanhai is talking about hardware accelerated video uh, late this afternoon. And then on Friday, Adam and Rob are talking about Shatter, which is a way of using multiple frame buffers. And Rob is talking about Clutter, a new rendering system. So I have a few minutes, about five minutes, 10 minutes? OK, 10 minutes for questions or comments. Jeff. Games developers, what do you mean? Like 3D games developers? 
Um, the infrastructure that we're building is enabling a huge number of formerly unsupported OpenGL extensions. A lot of the games that we're using these days desperately need these extensions. So in terms of being able to do more gaming and more 3D applications, we have been holding them back because our drivers have been so primitive. So they should be very happy with us. Okay, so obviously the question is, we're, I'm working at Intel and focusing on Intel graphics. Obviously there's, you know, a strong corporate interest for that. Am I, as a community member, ignoring the rest of the hardware world to my peril? And I don't think so. Um, obviously, uh, the Radeon development team has been very interested in our new kernel infrastructure and the, our new APIs. Uh, the Radeon driver, as I said, is adopting the GEM user space API, although they're layering it on some different kernel infrastructure. Uh, we'll see how that goes. The big question now is not across vendors. The big question is between integrated graphics and discrete graphics. Can this gem abstraction move to discrete graphics? Um, I would love to be able to go off and do that research and find out, but unfortunately, I don't have time right now, and I'm hoping the Rayon developers are going to be able to do that work. Um, obviously, it'll be help I'm working with them to try to make it happen, but I have finite time and have to get my drivers working. And it was really nice to be able to get one driver actually working. That was the goal here. The goal was not to prevent other people from getting their drivers working. The goal was to get at least one driver demonstrably working and try to move on from there. So I'm hoping it'll provide a good foundation for uh, discrete graphics development. So the question is, when I map something to the GPU, is it still mapped by the CPU? And the answer is, because I'm an Intel CPU, yes. It's okay. The Intel, an Intel CPU will not speculatively read from, uh, from mapped pages unless you ex ex execute instructions that are going to read from those pages. The AT, uh, AMD CPUs will occasionally speculatively read from those pages. And worse, they will, speculative, they will write back the same information that they, wrote, that they read accidentally. So on an AMD CPU, I can't keep it mapped into the CPU, but on an Intel CPU, it's perfectly safe. And what I do is when I move it back to the CPU domain, I don't have to remap it. Now all I have to do is invalidate it, which is a, at least a slightly cheaper operation. So I keep it mapped everywhere, and I worry about invalidating caches and not about changing mappings. That's all driver-specific code. Yeah. So it depends upon the driver that you're doing. Yep, really. I think, I'm not an expert on GPUs, but I seem to remember hearing that there are uh, certain features in, in Intel that seem to be the On, on some GPUs, for, like, for instance, the Mach 64, yes, you would have to, you would have to unmap it. Yeah. On the, Intel, on the Intel GPU, I actually have protections in the execution path that I can say, this is an unprivileged batch buffer. Don't let it execute anything that would hurt the hardware or go outside of its uh, 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 normally addressable memory. So I have hardware protections on, on my GPU. With newer Radeons, they have the same. The only one that I know of that has really bad problems is Mach 64, where you can actually um, change addresses by modifying batch buffers and have it access arbitrary system memory. So yeah, in those environments you'd have to go through and unmap things, which is not cheap, but at least it's not impossible. Yeah, yeah, it, it's it, like it, it, yeah, the infrastructure is there. It's just not cheap. Yeah, it's not a lot of code to write. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, can I clarify? OpenGL and Mesa are using GEM now. 
Gem and DRI too. Um, I can I can do some demos if I have some time. Yeah, it'll be cool. I have actually stuff that works this year. It's great. Other questions or comments? Yeah, demo. <laughs> I, wanna, I, I, can, I can show you. I can show you what everybody's been showing for a long time now. Yeah. I'm just going to do a brief demo. Hey, I have an appointment. I'm supposed to be teaching Legos today. So I'm going to start. One doesn't use compiz except for demos, right? One moment, please. Okay, usual comp is environment, blah, blah, blah. You know, <laughs> applications on a sphere. <laughs> oh, look. <laughs> okay, so what did we change? What did we successfully get to? Yes, indeed, I can have GLX gears on a sphere. <laughs> That's pretty much what we did. <laughs> <laughs> 